Look closely. What do we all have in common? No matter what corner of the world you live in, you need food, water, shelter, and money. Half of every transaction involves money in exchange for goods or services, stocks, a loaf of bread, illegal drugs. You gotta pay for it. We spend much of our lives chasing money to make a living and accomplish our dreams. But it's also an instrument of destruction, some might say evil, driving criminals to lie, steal, and even murder. The existing banking system extracts enormous value from society, and it is parasitic in nature. Money is a catalyst for the worst and the best of human endeavor. Before civilization, we created currency, fuel for wars, the path to power, champion and enemy of innovation. Money is so integral to our society and our global economy that its true nature remains a mystery to most. This is the story of money, perhaps the end of money as we know it. No matter how fat your bank account or how thin your wallet, to us it's all cold hard cash. There are some who want to kill it, get rid of it, burn your dollars, your euros, your yen, and transform every penny you have into ones and zeros. Digital currency, entrust it to the web and computers spread across the planet. Magic internet money, it's called cryptocurrency, Bitcoin. Invented in secret, it was a gift to the world. It's not just a currency, but it's actually programmable money. A potential curse on bankers. I and mean, there's nothing that the, the big banks or politicians can do to stop it. Breaking every government's grip on money supply. What the internet did for information, Bitcoin is doing for money. Could it be the new gold? Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, you have to really stretch your uh, imagination to infer what the intrinsic value of Bitcoin is. Regulators, the Federal Reserve, the banking system, at least understand this is a thing that they have to take seriously. This is going to change the economic culture. Bitcoin could be a microeconomic miracle worker, and it could be a macroeconomic wrecking ball. Is Bitcoin the currency of the future? A godsend for criminals? or a recipe for financial disaster. If you trust your money just as it is, we have a little story to share. Once upon a time, there was a big party with everyone standing around the punch bowl, drunk. Politicians credited the strong economy to their wise decisions. Businesses jumped into new profitable markets, ignoring risk. In fact, the experts said there was no risk. Then, troubling market data from minor countries spooked the markets. Rumors spread. More bad news rattled housing prices at the heart of the financial world. A major bank went insolvent. Investors and businesses made a run on the other banks, demanding their cash deposits. The largest financial institutions in the center of the modern world were frozen. Assets were seized. Banks foreclosed. A credit crunch threatened the entire world economy. And then, finally, the government stepped in. The largest bank bailout ever. Swift action by the head of state had saved the day. Remember that? No, you don't. It happened 2,000 years ago. Rome, 33 AD. Ground zero for the first recorded liquidity crisis and government bailout in history. The largest empire the world had ever seen was brought to its knees by a banking disaster. Emperor Tiberius used money from the national treasury to bail out the country's troubled banks and companies. History may not repeat itself, but it certainly rhymes, badly. People in power and their money have always been at the very center of it.
The story of money is as old as civilization itself. When we lived in small tribes, keeping track of debt was easy. You owed somebody a load of firewood. A neighbor owed you a piece of meat. Credits and debits were kept in your head, a mental ledger. Currency is a language that allows us to express transactional value between people. It's a technology that's older than uh, the wheel. It's as old as fire. When humans wanted to trade outside their tribe or village, they needed something everyone could agree had value, something scalable. Enter commodity monies. There were many kinds, but each had to embody the same five characteristics. A commodity money is relatively scarce, easily recognizable, can be cut into smaller pieces. You can substitute one piece for another of equal value, and you can carry it around without too much trouble. In ancient Rome, it was salt. The Aztecs used cacao beans. It was whale teeth on Fiji, yak dung in Tibet, shells in Africa and China. Grains, metal, ivory, rare stones, leather, fish. If it had the five characteristics of commodity money, someone probably used it as currency. And then you ask, what value do these currencies have? If you go into a primary school, you'll see children exchanging rubber bands and Tamagotchi and Pokemon cards and baseball cards and sweets and candy and any other form of currency. People invent currency when they have no other currency. And now they're going to invent digital currencies. But commodities that aren't durable are a lousy store of value. A bad cacao crop or a huge new salt discovery can throw your currency and economy into turmoil. A more stable system was needed. About 2,500 years ago, the first metal coins were minted in China and in what is now Turkey. These coins shared the same five characteristics with commodity money, but were also very durable. In some cases, coins are the only thing left of entire civilizations. Money does not originate with governments. Money arises naturally as markets uh, begin to develop and as people with a division of labor realize that if I have eggs and you have a cow, we may need some medium of exchange in order for you to buy my eggs or for me to buy your cow. Coins were an objective and universal unit of account, and they allowed people to buy and sell goods over vast regions. The market economy was born. Coins worked, but only if people trusted that the king or emperor who issued them wasn't cheating on the metal content. Using coins also meant that an authority now controlled the supply of your currency. Money and political power were inextricably linked, centralized. Minting coins in a steady and predictable manner allowed economic growth and stability. The Wushu coin in China retained its value for 500 years. In Constantinople, the Solidus lasted for 700 years. But in those times, the coins didn't have the, the milled, or this sort of milled edge. They were flat, and uh, what used to happen was, as coins were passing from people to people, people would cut little bits off. And in fact, some of the taxation that the kings would do would actually be take one-eighth of the coin off. Taxes built castles and financed military campaigns, expensive hobbies. Soon, royal mints were substituting cheaper metals for silver and gold. This is called debasement, and Europe's kings made a habit of it. The currency of France was debased every 20 months for 200 years. If no one can trust the gold or silver content of your coins, how can you trade with other countries? International merchants found a solution. They recognize that one person's debt has value. It can be traded or transferred. When those IOUs came from reputable sources, they could be used as a form of money, paper money. This money was not based on hard commodities or metal, but instead on someone's promise to pay. Merchant families like the Medici in 15th century Florence acted as clearinghouses for these IOUs. It worked like this. 
an English trader ordered a shipment of Italian cloth from the Medici for 100 gold coins. His promise to pay the Medici was put on paper. Meanwhile, the Medici owed 100 gold coins to another trading partner for delivery of wine from France. The parties didn't go to the expense of transporting and exchanging gold coins. Instead, the paper was transferred. Everyone agreed that the paper had value, 100 gold coins, but only because everyone trusted the Medici as solvent middlemen. They had created a paper money machine. Within a few generations, they rose from low crime to high finance. Their great wealth helped fuel the Italian Renaissance and elevated the family to levels of enormous political power, the power to marry into royal families and get elected as popes. The ties binding money to power, politics, and influence now ran through church and state. Merchants had proven that creating paper currency could be wildly profitable. Goldsmiths wanted in on the action. Imagine it like this. If the goldsmith had seen over a period of time that some of the coins he was storing for people were gathering dust, the people who owned them don't need them right now. So what if I go and lend them out into the community and I charge them interest on this loan? So he starts out lending some of these gold coins and then later, he realizes, actually, people don't even want the gold coins. They just want the piece of paper that says the, the, the gold coins are in the bank and with the goldsmith. So I can now make a loan with these pieces of paper. And whatever I write on a piece of paper, as long as people trust me, they'll trust the paper. And effectively, the, the goldsmiths and the early day bankers, they had literally acquired the power to print money. More and more, private paper money from merchants and banks circulated and began to rival the crown's coins. The power inherent in controlling and issuing money began slipping away from the rulers. They couldn't tax or debase this new kind of money, but they had bigger ambitions than ever with trading posts, colonies, and empires that now stretched across the globe. For centuries, European countries would take turns building massive fleets and waging war on each other to rule the world. Government wanted to take the people's money in order to finance its wars. That's essentially the history of money. Money and warfare go together. War is expensive. One year's income taxes simply aren't enough. Kings and queens had to borrow money against future taxes. They needed a groundbreaking financial innovation, government bonds. The loans came from rich merchant families and goldsmiths, who by now had become powerful financiers and bankers. Sovereign debt and deficit spending had been born. 